Good evening and welcome to a celebration of Nantucket Sound, our monthly webinar series. And I'm your host, Audra Parker. I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound, based here in Hyannis on Cape Cod. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a environmental organization dedicated to the permanent protection and preservation of Nantucket Sound the body of water that lies between Cape Cod and the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And this mission, the permanent protection of Nantucket Sound is especially crucial because of the Sound's unique geographical distribution or jurisdiction where you have, I'm not sure what happened to my map, where you have um, state waters that run from three miles from the shores of Cape Cod, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And those are protected under a state law called the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act. And there we go. And the center of Nantucket Sound is under federal jurisdiction. So the state waters are protected under state law, but the federal waters are wide open to development and leasing by the United States Department of the Interior. So the Alliance has worked for the last several years building a strong coalition of support um, for the protection of Nantucket Sound. And this coalition includes towns across the Cape and Islands, historic preservation groups, environmental organizations, chambers of commerce, um, tribal groups, and many, many others. So we have essentially been focusing on two tracks. We are trying to get a designation for Nantucket Sound as a national historic landmark. And that can be done either through Congress or through administrative action. Um, so we've been pursuing both tracks to help protect Nantucket Sound and to get the recognition that this special body of water deserves because of both its rich maritime and its, and its very um, rich tribal history. So the Alliance has been developing and promoting legislation called the Nantucket Sound National Historic Landmark Act, which would not only designate the sound as a national historic landmark, but also provide um, important environmental protections to address things like diminished water quality, habitat degradation, and other environmental threats, as well as really improve the consistency between state law and the federal waters in the center that um, remain unprotected. So that's what we're working on. And um, a celebration of Nantucket Sound is a monthly webinar series that features different speakers talking about the sound's cultural importance, its unique habitat, um, its economic importance, and um, its environment. So tonight I am very pleased to have Wendy Northcross join us, and she is going to be talking about the Kennedys and their love of and strong connection to Nantucket Sound. Um, and just a, a few words about Wendy's in very impressive background. Wendy serves as the executive director of the JFK Museum in Hyannis, which she co-founded in 1991. Um, and last year, after over 30 years, Wendy retired as CEO of the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. She also holds seats on several boards, chairs the Chamber's Canal Bridge Task Force, and has served in leadership roles in numerous organizations to promote economic development and tourism. And in 2021, she was named the Mercy Otis Warren Cape Cod Woman of the Year, the Cape Cod Commission's One Cape Summit Person of the Year, and the Cape Cod Young Professionals Inaugural Lifetime Community Leader. So very impressive background and um, huge contributor um, to, the, to the local community. So Wendy, why don't you turn your video on and show yourself? There you are. So welcome. We're very excited to have you here and just a um, little bit of logistics. So Wendy will um, give, a give her presentation on, on the Kennedys in Nantucket Sound. Um, and then afterwards, um, I'll come back to join her and we will take questions from the audience. And um, you can just send those to us in the in the Q and A function. So, thank you so much for for joining us, Wendy. Your your mute is on. You've got to turn your. And how many years have we been doing this? Thank <laughs> That's you. okay. <laughs> we we like to forget I'm, I'm, things quickly. I'm really pleased to be here, Audra. Thank you for asking. And um, I just have to um, turn on the the PowerPoint presentation. It's far better than than watching me, but. 
thank you for inviting us at the JFK Highness Museum to be part of your uh, celebration of Nantucket Sound. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Okay, I'll let you do that, and I will turn myself off, and I will um, see you back after after your presentation. Look That's forward to it. Great, thank you. Hopefully, this will work, and there we go. Okay, great. So Audra gave you a little bit of background, um, but yes, the museum is celebrating its 31st anniversary. We were actually created by the Hyannis Area Chamber of Commerce out of this intense um, curiosity that people still have to this day, 60 years after the president's been gone, uh, people still pilgrimage to Hyannis to learn something about President Kennedy's time in our place, to maybe see a Kennedy, to tour the Kennedy compound, which of course you can't because they still live there. And um, just try to understand the whole Kennedy story from the Cape Cod perspective. So that's our mission. We really try to, we're not the presidential library. We uh, work well with them. We share a lot of information um, back and forth, but we tell the Cape Cod story. So certainly, the story of the Kennedys on Nantucket Sound factors in quite quite well with the um, Alliance's mission. So, so my story starts uh, tonight with explaining to people, you know, again, we get people from all over the world here and I have to explain to them that Hyannis Port is not an incorporated city. It is merely a neighborhood in the town of Barnstable. And this beach that you're looking at here was taken a year ago. It's if you were to follow the sandy soil right around to the left, you would come across the three houses that comprise the beginnings of the Kennedy compound. Uh, but the story of how the Kennedys got here is also fascinating. The Kennedy family um, was from Boston. Joe Sr., Papa Joe, or Ambassador Joe, as we call him, and his wife, Rose Kennedy. She was the daughter of the mayor of Boston, uh, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. They were married, they were raising a big family, and Joe was becoming a, a multimillionaire pretty quickly. By the age of 38 in 1926, Joe was worth $2 million. Today, that's $31 million. Uh, he was the youngest bank president at the age of 25. He was a financier who was really interested in um, investing in emerging companies. Um, he was not a bootlegger. We get that question a lot. That, that was basically campaign trash talk that um, he uh, was you know, smuggling booze onto the shores of the Commonwealth and making a fortune from it. What he did do during prohibition is he had the rights, the sole rights to distribute Hague and Hague and Dewar Scotch from Scotland. He had the sole rights to distribute them in the United States once prohibition ended. He was making a bet that prohibition would end and he made another fortune from that. So the um, family was becoming quite well-to-do and as all well-to-do families that live in the city were were doing in the summertime is they were finding a summer place. So he and Rose decided to find a place they could go every summer to get their kids out of the city. They tried Seacoast, New Hampshire, and that was fine. Uh, they tried Cohasset. They liked Cohasset just south of Boston a little better. Joe decided to join the golf club, but they never acted on his application. It just got tabled. Uh, you might imagine why, but it was really, he had three strikes against him. He was Irish, he was Catholic, and he was made of new money. He didn't come from generations of old Boston money. So they just um, put a pass on Joe Kennedy's membership. So Joe was not happy with that. He said to Rose, come on, we're going to keep looking for a summer place. They decided against Newport, Rhode Island, because there were still a lot of Boston Brahmins there. But Joe had been brought to Cape Cod as a, as a young man by, or as, as a young boy by his father. So he said, let's try Cape Cod. Now, it's the early 20s, Cape Cod's sort of a backwater. We were not on the map. Really, we weren't on the map until JFK became president. But they did, we did have a lot going for us, including these uh, lovely sandy beaches that you see. We had railroad access. 
We had a Catholic church. Uh, we had a golf club that would eventually accept Joe into membership. And we had a yacht club because Joe Sr. wanted his kids to learn how to sail. That was an opportunity he had never had. So I like to have a little fun with this picture. This is the growing family. Uh, they found the Malcolm Cottage in Hyannisport and they rented it from 1925 until 1928. And here's the family in front of the Malcolm Cottage in Hyannisport. And going from the right-hand side from the oldest down to the youngest, I'll give you just a quick little family uh, bio here. So the oldest son is Joe Jr. He was actually tragically killed in World War II. He was, he was missing in action and then declared um, killed in a dangerous bombing mission. The next, next son is uh, John, Jack, they called him. Of course, the politician looking straight at the camera, big smile. You know, he had a lot of charisma even back then. His oldest sister is Rosemary. Now, Rosemary was born with brain injuries, and she always had uh, great challenges. She eventually had an experimental lobotomy that didn't go well, but she lived a long time. She spent a lot of time in Hyannisport. She was a frequent visitor here at the museum. The next sister is Kathleen, or Kick was her nickname. She had married a man from Britain while she was in London when their dad was the ambassador to the court of St. James. She met and married a man who was also killed in action in World War II. She soon started to date a man who was flying her to France to meet her dad. Uh, Papa Joe was in France. They were killed tragically in an airplane accident. She died at the age of 28. Now this devastated uh, President Kennedy Jack. He was he was closest to all of his siblings to kick. She and he were soulmates of the same personality, same sense of humor, but she um, was gone at the age of 28. The next oldest sister, that's Eunice. We know her as Eunice Shriver. They would call her Puny Uni uh, because she was always skinny as a rail. She actually had Addison's disease as did her brother, Jack. But she soon became her sister Rosemary's great champion. She was very competitive, very smart, and she uh, formed Special Olympics eventually. And her family continues the public service to help people that are otherly abled. The other sister that you see there after Eunice, that's Patricia. She married the actor Peter Lawford. She was kind of the quiet one in the family. So there's a fun story about Patricia I'm just going to share quickly. She um, during her brother Jack's engagement party that was held at the compound when Jack and Jackie were getting uh, engaged to be married, the siblings decided to have a scavenger hunt to celebrate. So they decided whoever could bring home the biggest prize would, would, would um, the biggest thing would win the prize. So Patricia, a little quiet Patricia, came downtown Hyannis. She hotwired a bus. She drove it to the compound and she won the prize. The next uh, son there is, as you can imagine, that's Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, who we know his story pretty well. But you look at this age difference now. He ran his brother's national campaign for the presidency. Um, Bobby Kennedy was, was quite competitive as well. And the baby, a lot of people call uh, the baby Ted Kennedy, but Ted's not even born yet. That's baby Jean Kennedy. She eventually became the ambassador to Ireland. And she lived the longest of all the siblings. Uh, Senator Ted Kennedy was born in 1932. But they rented the house for a few years. Uh, Rose finally said, this will do. I think this place fits the bill. So Joe immediately bought it. And then he immediately enlarged it to 15 rooms. And he made sure there were nine bathrooms, nine kids, nine bathrooms. I guess that kept peace in the household. But it's a beautiful white wooden shingle um, house, wide porches. They had two and a half acres of rolling land right down to the beach. They had a tennis court. They had an amazing view of Nantucket Sound. It's a superb view. So uh, they doubled the size of the house. And Joe, because now he's well invested in making money from Hollywood, producing and distributing Hollywood movies, including the first talking movies. He had a talk, the first private talking movie projector in the basement of the big house facing Nantucket Sound. 
But more importantly, probably, is this is where Joe and Rose Kennedy, uh, this was the backdrop to which they would raise their children. This is where they taught them to be competitive, especially Papa Joe. His mantra was win, win, win. There's no room in this family for second place. And by 1941, this became the primary residence for Joe and Rose and then later Senator Ted Kennedy, all of whom died in this, in this house. But many people think of it as just a summer place, just the summer White House. And in fact, it was their, their, their home. This is where they came for school vacations and their um, Thanksgiving dinners, especially. I love this picture of Rose Kennedy with the kids all lined up by age again, uh, learning to swim in Nantucket Sound. Rose Kennedy was really the disciplinarian in the family. She had strict rules that you had to be at the dinner table by seven and you had to have done your civic lessons for the day because you might get called on to answer a hard question. And don't think you were lucky if you didn't get called on because you might have to fact check your siblings. So everybody had to have their homework done by the time they showed up for dinner every night. What they loved to do uh, was teach the kids to sail. As I said, the Papa Joe, uh, he loved power craft and had quite a few boats, but he never really knew how to sail and he wanted his kids to learn how to sail. According to the source uh, of a book written by Julius Fanta, was published in 1968 called Sailing with President Kennedy. So Kennedy's love for the sea stemmed from his love for sailing. His father had developed fondness for boats and had a particular desire to see his sons learn to master the wind and the sea under sail. JFK's father was an ardent yachting enthusiast and he um, had owned both sailboats and power craft. His uh, more favorite was the Marlin and we would often see the Marlin moored out in, off the compound or, or sailing around Highness Harbor, Lewis Bay and Nantucket Sound. But as youngsters, uh, Jack, and Teddy and Joe, as they were learning, they were really confined to sailing behind the breakwater that, that juts out from the, the Kennedy compound house. Anything beyond that was really off limits while you were learning how to sail. You know, the sea had such an influence on the Kennedy brothers that Joe Jr., Jack, and Bobby would all enlist in the Navy or the Naval Reserve. Love this photo. It's from the private collection of the family. Uh, shows JFK in 1942 in his dress white. And in 1943, after much lobbying of his father and his naval superiors, JFK became the captain of a PT-109 boat. Uh, these were very fast boats from the Mosquito Fleet. They were made of mahogany plywood, and he was assigned to uh, the South Pacific. Unfortunately, JFK's PT-109 boat, as many know, was splintered by a Japanese destroyer. Two crew members died, but 10 survived. And that was largely due to JFK's strength as a swimmer. And it's definitely a skill that was honed in the waters of Nantucket Sound. JFK, in saving his crew members, he swam for four to five hours. And in one case, towed an injured Seaman uh, by his life jacket with the straps, clenching the straps in his teeth, JFK's teeth. He was towing his uh, sailor crew member. Um, interestingly, I just from this, found this out recently. JFK first saw a PT boat moored at Martha's Vineyard. And then I learned that nearly all the 14,000 officers and crew for PT boats were trained at a small Navy base in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. So who knew? Uh, this picture is, is kind of compelling too. This is Bobby Kennedy being sworn into the Navy. He was just 18 years old. Bobby served as a seaman aboard the USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. in the Mediterranean Sea in 1944 to 1945. So Bobby's ship was named for his oldest brother. Six weeks after his promotion to a full lieutenant, 20-year-old Navy pilot Joe P. Kennedy Jr. volunteered with a lieutenant from Newark, New Jersey to fly a B-26 Liberator that was heavily loaded with explosives. Uh, it was essentially called a drone, but they were having to um, target a V-2 rocket launch site, and they were going to bail out before 
the plane made its um, target when it would explode over the target. Unfortunately, the airplane exploded uh, prematurely and the crew was lost. Uh, the Navy and Marine Medal of Honor was awarded posthumously to Joe Jr. And in keeping with the, with the Navy's tradition of naming destroyers after American naval heroes, the pilot Joe Jr. was so honored. And it was Bobby that, that sailed on that boat um, as a crew member. In interestingly, too, in his autobiography, Senator Ted Kennedy wrote about the family's reaction upon hearing of, of the loss of their oldest brother, uh, Joe Jr. And he wrote, Everyone was crying. Some wailed. Dad stumbled back up the stairs. He did not want us to witness his own dissolution into sobs. After 15 minutes, Jack spoke up. Joe wouldn't want us sitting here crying, he said. He would want us to go sailing. Let's go sailing. Teddy, Joey, get the sails. We're going sailing. And that's what we did. It's been said that throughout his career um, in public service, John Kennedy's personal interest in naval and maritime affairs really served him well in performing his duties as president. And today, uh, the Navy is building the second aircraft carrier named for President Kennedy. Here is a picture of the crew from CBN 79. Um, it is a little delayed in its construction, but the crew are being recruited and trained, and they all come to Hyannisport. They come to our museum every year with different crew members so they can learn more about their president. And here we are showing them kind of the vista over Squaw Island and the golf course that President Kennedy used to love to play at um, in Hyannisport overlooking Nantucket Sound. You can Google the CVN 79. Uh, to find its website, some fascinating information there about the aircraft carrier. So after World War II, JFK came home. Uh, he healed from his war injuries and he accepted the mantle that his father had, had desired first for his older brother to become president of the United States someday. And so Jack ran for U.S. House. He won the seat that was his grandfather's seat. Uh, in Boston, and then he won in 1952 the seat at the U.S. Senate as the Massachusetts junior senator. And then by 1960, he decided it was time to run for president. He knew that Richard Nixon would be his opponent, he knew it would be a tight race, but he said now is the time. He enlisted his brother Bobby to run the national campaign and, in fact, uh, hit the campaign trail hard. He and Jackie flew home on election day to Boston. They voted there, but then they came to the Cape to await the election returns. And it was a very, very tight race. And you know that he did, he did win, that's no spoiler alert there, but the popular vote that JFK received was just less than 113,000 votes. So today you hear us talking about 7 million votes, 8 million votes. Well, this was a real squeaker. Now we know uh, life pretty much changed on Cape Cod uh, for us. Uh, by that point, he, here we go. He had um, the president from the presidential diaries. We know that JFK would come home from the White House to Cape Cod every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in June, July, and August during the entire presidency. He would get off the helicopter that landed on his father's front lawn. The kids would come running out to greet him. He would run into the house and change his clothes. Then he would load up as many kids as would fit in the Tunerville trolley golf cart. And they'd go tearing down the driveway and around the corner and up to the candy store and load the kids up with penny candy and come tearing back. Um, it was great fun. It was all about family. He very rarely wanted to work while he was on Cape Cod. But after, um, after looking at this picture, I got some comfort to realize that the, the golf cart is, least is registered to be on the streets of <laughs> the Commonwealth. Um, they would mostly spend their time, you know, being together as a family. They loved to go horseback riding in Marston's Mills. They loved tennis. They loved golf. They loved touch football. They loved water skiing. They even hired a local Cape Codder to make sure that Jackie and astronaut John Glenn would be able to water ski, which you can see the evidence here. They did quite well up there on Nantucket Sound. 
Um, and they enjoyed swimming, lots and lots of swimming. And from the beach, they would swim, but largely they would just jump overboard from one of the many boats that they had. Here's Caroline swimming off of one of the boats in, in the um, waters off the compound. And President Kennedy had a story that he made up about a white shark that would eat socks. Uh, I guess it was one of Caroline's favorite stories, but it didn't seem to keep her out of the water. The Kennedys loved their boats. They had all kinds of boats and they had all sizes of boats. They had a small Navy of their own. They still do actually. And these are some um, really fun pictures. As president though, JFK had his choice of luxurious naval yachts that could become the floating White House. He had passed on a magnificent 172 foot steel schooner um, and some other pretentious yachts like sort of reminiscent of, of Britannia that was Queen Victoria's favorite. Um, instead, he selected a 92 foot power cruiser from the Navy fleet that had been used in the Eisenhower administration. And it was this yacht that he, that he selected. He renamed it the Honey Fitz in honor of his grandfather who was the mayor of Boston, Rose's father, Honey Fitz. And this yacht he used for state occasions. He uh, used it for official duties because at heart, he really was a sailing skipper. The Honey Pits actually made an appearance in Hyannis Harbor well, about a, over a decade ago. And I'll never forget um, touring it and the reverence that some of our local captains had as they carefully took off their shoes before they came aboard to take the tour of the, um, of the Honey Fitz. It was a beautiful, beautiful boat. There was another boat that the president was able to secure for his, his personal White House floating White House duties, and that was an academy racing yawl. It was called the Manitou, and it was um, also painted white to reflect the floating White House. He sailed it frequently on the East Coast. He even had Edward, uh, Edward Muskie on it once when he sailed up to Maine. But it almost didn't matter what type of boat the Kennedy family enjoyed, as long as it got them on the water, or they could race against each other. Uh, even in extreme weather, they would like to be out on Nantucket Sound. I love this picture of John Jr. on Double Trouble. Uh, JFK Jr. wrote a letter to his uncle, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, that, that the senator shared with us once here at the museum. He said, um, he read it to us, and I, and I wished we had, had been given the letter because it was such a perfect Cape Cod Kennedy story, but it seems like John Jr. was railing against his uncle's propensity for sticking to the annual Thanksgiving tradition of taking a, a sail on Nantucket Sound, regardless of the weather. And I guess they'd been out there in some pretty, some pretty brutal days, but they were out sailing. Sailing was the president's passion. He, had, he was an avid and expert sailor. He spent 31 years sailing his boat, Victoria. It was a Liano senior that was given to him by his father as a 15th birthday gift. And on many occasions as Senator and then as president, the first year in the White House, especially Kennedy packed his family, including the first lady and their children, Caroline and John and his brothers, Bobby and Ted, they would all pack into the Victoria for afternoon sailing jaunts. And they ventured outside the Hyannis Port breakwater into Nantucket Sound when the wind um, was not too strong. Uh, however, according to author Julius Fanta, the president preferred a vigorous sail in a stiff wind and licking the salt water from my lips during a competitive race. Well, not, not the author's lips, Kennedy's lips. He preferred the rough and tumble and the competitive sail JFK was also the only president elect who ever wrote an article for Sports Illustrated. The magazine had actually sent a photojournalist to, to do the interview, David Zing. And Zing was asking him about the sailing races that he had won and he started to rattle them off. And he finally grabbed a pencil and a piece of paper. He said, here, I'll just, I'll jot them down for you. So the handwritten list of the races that President Kennedy won most most of them on Nantucket Sound made it into the magazine article, um, as did this amazing photo by David Zing. And I just can't even imagine where, how he was uh, holding on to a mask and trying to get this great photo of, of uh, JFK in the cockpit of his 
beloved Guiano Sr. Some of these photos are fun too. For those of you that are familiar with Nantucket Sound, uh, I love seeing this picture of, of uh, JFK with his sailboat close to Fort Speech uh, near Sam Barber's former auto, um, artist studio. In college uh, at Harvard, Jack and his brother Joe Jr., they were both members of the Harvard Yacht Club. They each sailed a boat to victory uh, to win the Macmillan Cup for Harvard. The Kennedys owned many Wiano Juniors and Wiano Seniors, and one was famously named by Papa Joe as 10 of us. So they had 10 people in the family. And then Teddy was born, and they got another boat, and they named it one more. This uh, boat, this photo too, if you look in the background, you'll see the, the letters HYC on the roof of the Heinisch Yacht Club. And next to it is the old Yachtsman Hotel. It's now a condominium complex called the Yachtsman. But JFK particularly loved his Riano Sr. He, it was made here on Cape Cod by the Crosby family in Osterville. His sail was number 94. It was a beautiful sleek wooden boat and was designed for the shallow waters of Cape Cod. Uh, it was a one design. And I ask people quite often, do you know what a one design is? And most people don't know. And I say, well, all the boats are designed the same. So if you win, it's because of your talent as a skipper. And JFK was very proud of the times that he won in his boat. We also know that uh, when in, in important meetings, pre the president would make doodles and notes on his yellow legal pad. And we have a sample of some of those notes here in the museum exhibit. Uh, one very poignant was taken, his notes that he was taking during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he's got doodles of sailboats on those uh, tense meeting notes. After the president's death, Bobby and Ted and Eunice would continue to sail the Victoria. Uh, the beloved boat can be seen in the summer at the JFK Library in Boston, but she does spend her winters here at the Crosby Yacht Yard being well cared for. It's interesting to note too that as president, JFK really went to bat for his favorite sport of sailing. He was the first president in the 111 year history at the time of the America's Cup races to be on deck throughout the entire series. So he was the first head of state since 1851 when Queen Victoria witnessed the finish of the very first race when the schooner America won the trophy and brought it home from England to our shores. And for those of you that don't know, the America's Cup is one of the oldest international sporting trophies in history. Uh, John, Cox is, uh, John Cox Stephen, who's a member of the New York Yacht Club formed a six person syndicate to build a yacht to take to England and race it to make some money. And in 1851, the Royal Yacht Squadron from England and the New York Yacht Club raced around the Isle of Wight in England and the New York Yacht Club won, quickly renaming the sport America's Cup. Some of the other Kennedy boats included uh, um, Senator Ted Kennedy's cherished antique wooden schooner, the Maya. This was the subject of many of his oil paintings. We, he gave one to the museum, and if you come visit us, you can see his oil painting. Uh, Ted wrote about this when he received, well, he, Ted wrote an autobiography, and he wrote about when he received a diagnosis of um, malignant brain tumor in 2008. And he said he and his wife, Vicki, began to make a plan uh, of action but he said the first step was to sail. And he wrote, uh, quote, sailing for me has always been a metaphor for life. But the day I left Mass General and stepped aboard Maya, our sail was more than a metaphor. It was an affirmation of life. Ted tells us of his hero worship of his oldest brothers too, who were his earliest sailing instructors. And they encouraged him um, more than, than they knew. He said, um, they encouraged me more than they even knew. He said, I made my first solo sailing under their watchful eyes. You can go as far as that boat anchored over there, Teddy, then sail back to us. Stay inside the breakwater. Let me see you tack. Let me see you jive. Senator Ted Kennedy died in 2009. My husband and I spent most of the day watching the funeral proceedings on TV. 
it was a long and sad day after the services in Boston were, um, they flew to Washington, D.C., and his committal service was at Arlington National Cemetery. But then the family came back home to Cape Cod that very same night after this long and sad day. And they went sailing on Maya, right fitting. As I said, there've been many Kennedy boats on Nantucket Sound over the last century. Uh, last summer, Max Kennedy, one of Bobby Kennedy's sons, hosted a 75th birthday party for his yawl named Glide. It's a beautiful work of art. We were so honored to go and, and see it. And uh, it's a boat that Ted Kennedy Jr. had once owned. Ted and his wife Kiki actually lived on the boat for a while when it was anchored next to the USS Constitution in Charlestown. Of course, there's many more stories and there's many more boats, but we'll leave you wanting more so that you'll come to the museum and see some of our exhibits and hear some more of our stories. Um, I wanna thank the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound for your work to, that you do to keep a special place special. It's here that President Kennedy and the entire Kennedy family learned seamanship and survival skills, which gave their lives such perspective. And to paraphrase the author, James Graham, who wrote a book about the Kennedys and their boat, Victoria, and their connection to the sea. He said, Cape Cod and Nantucket Sound had a strong influence on the lives of a few extraordinary people who more than most helped define America in the second half of the 20th century. And we do know that President Kennedy so loved Cape Cod that when he was a senator, he wrote the legislation for, and then as president signed into law, the bill that created the Cape Cod National Seashore, forever preserving the great beach and the outer arm of the Cape and just keeping it available in its raw and wild state for generations to come. And I think he would be very proud of the work that you're doing for Nantucket Sound. So I thank you, I'm happy to um, stay on and take some questions and have a little bit of a conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy. That was great. Really, really interesting. Some great photos. I, I know I, for one, learned quite a bit. So let me just um, find these, these questions. And okay, um, first question is, did the Kennedys have a favorite spot or a beach? Oh gosh. They, well, they had a, their own private beach. And I think what was more important was the boats that took them to swim wherever they wanted to swim. And, you know, they went a lot of times to Nantucket and to Martha's Vineyard. Um, they also had, uh, you know, a place in Florida in the winter, but they really truly, this was home. This was like, this was the heart and the home. This wasn't just a vacation spot. Um. Okay, comment from Robert, who says, Wendy, thank you so much for the great presentation. Awesome to have you at the helm at JFK mm -hmm. Museum. That's nice. That's nice. Um, thank you. Another question from an anonymous attendee that's asking, where is the original JFK aircraft carrier today? Oh, the original, I think, is being dismantled. Okay, okay. I think um, they... They work to recycle those things now. I don't know how you recycle a whole aircraft carrier. <laughs> it has to be dismantled. Okay. Um, how much of an impact would you say the family had on tourism to Cape Cod, both you know earlier and, and still today? Well, you saw that whole arc. I mean, they've been here since the 1920s and they were nice neighbors and just part of the fabric of, of Cape Cod. And it wasn't until um, JFK was elected president that things changed dramatically. In the 1960 town report for the town of Barnstable, the, um, it, it says, well, thank goodness the election is over and we can go back to the way life was because it was quite a crush of people here that were covering this dynamic and vigorous candidate for president and his whole family. And there was just a lot of interest and people thought, well, good, that now we'll go back to normal. Well, that never happened. So I think that that when we became a Dateline Hyannis sport, that's when our lives changed pretty dramatically. And I think that's part of why President Kennedy worked to get the Cape Cod National Seashore established because he could see the changes that were happening. We weren't ready for the rapid growth and development that came in surges upon us because 
family had been here for, for decades already, but it was that presidency that really put us in the spotlight and kind of changed the place forever. And here it is 60 years later, and people are still making that trip to see something, to learn something. Right. No, definitely. It's a big, a big draw. How many, how many visitors do you get at the museum? Well, that's a great question. Pre-pandemic, we were between 60 and 70,000 visitors a year. Um, we went down to 7,000 visitors during the pandemic. And that's part of the reason I'm here is trying to like recover from that and build back and and we've had we've had some pretty good years. What, what's really been missing is the international visitor. We have a lot of people that come from Ireland, as you can imagine, and we kind of miss them. They're starting to trickle back. Well, hopefully we'll see more of that. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth is asking, is the honey fit still in the water and might one catch a sight of it in New England waters? And it's a beautiful boat. <laughs> it is a beautiful boat. Um, the person that owns it, um, you can rent it for an event or a party. So they have it, um, you know, if Dick Neitz was on, on the call, he could tell you exactly where the boat is, but it's kept in warmer waters. It may come back to New England. I don't think it's, it's that close by though. Okay. Um, okay. Joanne says, I understand the main house is now owned by the Edward Kennedy Institute. What is it being used for now? And will visitors ever be allowed to see the house? Those are great questions. Yes, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute that was created when uh, Senator Ted passed is an amazing institution that recreates the Senate chambers in a building next to the Presidential Library in Boston. Uh, they own the big house and they're, they're trying to discern the best use for that house. They are imagining a Camp David style place for retreats for, you know, peace talks or learning history or, you know, there's just, they're still trying to balance um, a useful purpose of the house in a, in a pretty small neighborhood. I mean, it was amazing that the helicopter landed in the front yard when JFK was president. It was pretty disruptive of this, of this small, tight little neighborhood. And you have a lot of close by neighbors. So I don't think it'll become um, actively toured, but there may be a way to have managed access to the house. So the EMKI, Edward M. Kennedy Institute is working on how to balance that. Okay, great. Um, a comment from Bill, he says, Ted loved Egg Island off of Great Island and saw him tied up there on, saw him tied up there on Maya countless Sundays. I'll bet. I, I loved Egg Island, but I ran aground there once, so. <laughs> you don't love it so much anymore. Oh, not the same quite feeling. But no, yeah, they, and it was really um, quite touching when Ted was, was, was very ill. Um, they kept a light on the mast of the Maya so he could see it from his house. He could see the Maya, even though. Oh, that's he, wonderful. But yeah. Um, Elaine says, I know that my grandparents, who were the same age as JFK, honeymooned in Truro in 1946. They are from Southern Connecticut. Would you say tourism was localized prior to the 1960 election? It just seems like it was always part of my mom's, fam my mom's family growing up in Connecticut for vacations. Oh, definitely. You know, I mean, the, the Kennedys didn't invent Cape Cod as a, as a vacation destination. They just made it world famous, <laughs> you know. They just made more people interested in, in seeing it somehow. Um, yeah, it, it, we actually are working on some new exhibits to talk about how many presidents over time have come to the New England area for recreation and rest and relaxation. And it didn't start with President Kennedy. He just made it probably the most famous. Right. Um, okay, Judy says, what changes to Nantucket Sound and surrounding land and waters have the Kennedy family witnessed since the 1920s? Any hurricanes, ferry traffic, tour boats? Oh, I'd probably say all of the above. You know, they bought that house in 1928. So there was big hurricanes in the 30s. Um, they probably saw an immense amount of um, activity from ferry boats. There were some pretty cool ferry boats going back and forth between Nantucket and Hyannis at the time, but I would say they they probably saw you know the the, the rapid development of housing around 
the Hyannis Harbor area, especially. And that's that's brought along a lot of challenges to our community, including water quality, where we purposefully did not build sewer systems on Cape Cod to keep the population down, keep the amount of housing built down, which didn't really work, but we didn't really do the right thing by our water too. So I think they probably saw some of that. Uh, I think that it's interesting to note now what was originally three houses for the Kennedy compound has grown into over 11 houses in the general area that, the, that some member of the Kennedy family owns, whether they're Smith, Shriver, Kennedy, you know, they've, they've really continued. This place is really very important to them. And, and um, RFK Jr. has a house here. Patrick Kennedy has a house here. Edward M. Kennedy Jr. owns the president's house, which Caroline had and sold to, to Ted Jr. Um, Ethel Kennedy still lives here. You know, so there's still, they. a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same too. It still has that that beautiful New England vernacular close neighborhood feel. It really does. It's a ve it's a very special community there. It seems everyone everyone knows knows one another. Everybody and it's knows pretty, everybody. You know, for, yeah, and it's pretty pretty compact. Um, yeah. Elizabeth says it would be so wonderful if the U.S. would use the Kennedy Home for future official business. And they may. It could be very cool. You know, Adam Hines, who's the new, the new CEO at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, he actually. Uh, worked for the United Nations in peacekeeping in the Middle East for a while. So we'll see. We'll see what they cook up. Um, here's a here's a interesting or funny one. Brian says, any idea why there was no longer a presidential yacht? When I become president, that will be one of my first executive orders. That's a great question. I don't know. Is there not a presidential yacht? Do we just not know about it? I don't know. I've I've not been invited. Well, we'll have to find that out. <laughs> we will. We'll get back to you, Brian, on that one. And good luck with your um, bid to become president. Yeah, invite us when you, we'll, we'll vote for you, Brian. There you go. Okay. Right. Um, Joanne says, uh, visitors often ask, where's the Kennedy compound? What's the best way for residents to answer this? We always said the Kennedy compound is just at, you know, just down the road, about two miles from downtown Hyannis. But it's a very small residential neighborhood. The homes aren't open for touring. You aren't probably going to figure out which house is which, not easily seen from the road. Best way to see them is from the water. So if you take a harbor cruise, either for the Scudder family or some of the private boats, that's the best way. And then somebody can point out the right house. There's a big house right next door to the, to, um, the first house, Joe and Rose's house got big columns, always has a big flag flying. And a lot of people zero in on that. And I've seen it published incorrectly. So here's the Kennedy compound and we laugh. We say, no, 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 that's belongs to a Republican. <laughs> AFK was running for president. That family, I don't know if it was the same family, but it was a Republican living there at the time too. And he put a big billboard in his front yard that said, vote Nixon. That's great. Um, uh, Bill says, do you know the story of Bobby jumping into the sea and he didn't know how to swim? No. <laughs> Don't tell. I can't believe a Kennedy didn't know how to swim. I'm not buying that one. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Danielle says USS Sequoia is the former presidential yacht used during the administrations of Herbert Hoover through Jimmy Carter. Setting a cost-cutting example, Carter ordered her sold in 1977. There you go. So now we know. So, there you go. Um, okay. And um, one, one last question. What is your favorite story about the Kennedy family? I kind of like the Patricia stealing the bus. That, that is pretty amazing. <laughs> Taking it. I told that to Ted Jr. And he goes, really? He goes, that's a great story. Now, I think uh, I, I really has hesitated to take this task on in retirement with a museum, but, you know, we really did go through something during COVID and wanted to make sure it's still here for future generations. And I thought, I'm not sure I can just focus on the Kennedys all day, every day, but the longer I'm here and the more that I learn, it's like an amazing family of quite selfless service, very smart, very motivated to succeed, but to do right, to do the right thing. And and the, the 
the example that they set still resonates with people today. People coming into the museum often leave in tears and thank us and are just moved by the incredible, you know, the incredible sacrifice of this family to public service. But they also had a really good time with each other and with life. And, and you know, I love the Ted Kennedy thing about sailing was an uh, you know, affirmation of life. They just grabbed every moment that they could and, and enjoyed what they could. And, and I, we all benefited from that. So it is an incredible story. Um, yeah. So, Wendy, I wanted to thank you. And then um, I wanted to show the audience that um, last, I guess it was last year, maybe even longer than that, um, oh. Wendy was nice enough to record a TV spot for us about Nantucket Sound. And I think it ties in really well with the conversation that we just had. So it's just a short 30 second clip that that I wanna show. There's only one Nantucket Sound. There's only one Cape Cod. President Kennedy came here as a child. When he realized that parts of the Cape were being threatened, we were losing kind of the essence of Cape Cod. He actually filed legislation to create the Cape Cod National Seashore. Future generations will have the same wants and aspirations that we have. We have the knowledge, we have the science, we have the means, and we have the desire. It's incumbent on our generation to make sure it's here for future generations. We won't go into the other ones, but th no, thank you. I think that just like tied everything together really well. So it's so much appreciate um, you talking about the Kennedys and helping us develop an even stronger appreciation for Nantucket Sound and, you know, how important this body of water was to, you know, one one very prominent family here that may obviously made a, a big difference on Cape Cod. So thank you, Wendy, for joining us. Thank you, Adra. Adra, keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay. All right. So thank, thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. You can reach me at audra at saveoursound.org. Our website is also saveoursound.org and our, our phone number is up there. You can follow us on, on social media. And our next webinar will be on May 4th. Um, it Waves of Wonder, A History of Nantucket Sound with historian and author Teresa Mitchell. So We'll send out emails, but you can go on our website at saveoursound.org forward slash ACONS, which is a celebration of Nantucket Sound to register. So thanks for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you at our next session. All right. Thanks. Bye.